The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over how you can grow the best tomatoes you've ever had, as well as nematodes, the good ones and the bad ones. Our guest will be author Kelly D. Norris and answering your garden questions. That all starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This show is about you, for you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, and preserving what you grow indoors and out, as well as get your grass a little bit greener. You can find us in a couple of different platforms. Uh, you can get a hold of us in a couple of different platforms. You can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. If you'd like to talk to us, have a question for us, we can certainly get your question answered. If you can't get through, leave a message. We will call you back. If you're, We thank you for taking time out of your day, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 stations that are broadcasting our program across the United States and in uh, a mobile app the in-studio video replay or podcast replay or anywhere in between. We thank you for doing such. One of the most popular crops that many people will grow, whether they grow one or they grow a whole garden full of them, Holly, is tomatoes. That's right. So when people have um, always questions about tomatoes, how to grow the best tomatoes, how to deal with tomato problems. So today we're going to talk about how to grow the best tomatoes. Now we're just going to we're going to try to unwrap as much as we can in this topic. This is a topic for a whole show of itself, not just a segment. So when we get through with all of this, if we haven't answered your question, you can you know send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com with a specific area in which you would like an answer for, and we will get that information to you. So first, we want to plant our tomatoes deep. Whether we've started them indoors, whether we bought them from a garden center, when it's time to plant, it's time to bury them deep. Explain what that means. Sure. So tomatoes are part of the nightshade family, which simply means that for for along their whole stem, there are roots that could grow. Now, if you don't bury the stem part, are roots going to grow out of the the stem? No. But if you bury the stem, no matter if you bury it right to the top leaf, it will form roots when it hits that soil. So when you bury, when we say bury them deep, what we mean is take. I don't know. Three quarters of the plant. Yeah, three quarters yeah. of the plant and bury that, and then you'll have all that root structure underneath the soil, and the rest of the top of the tomato will grow just fine. The more roots you have on the plant, the more productive and healthier and more nutrients that plant is going to be able to uptake. And when you bury that plant deep, you want to remove all the leaves and the limbs that are going to be under the soil. You want to have that little canopy above the soil, but everything else, it should just be stem. Remove the other limbs and leaves. Now, one of the main problems that tomatoes get early on in the season is called early blight. It is a disease, a soil-borne bacteria that's in everybody's soil. So whether you buy soil from the garden center, you make it, you got it out of the back 40, it's going to have some type of early blight in it. Early blight is the discoloration of the plant as uh, it progressively works up the plant from early on in the season till the end of the season when the leaves go from green to yellow, to brown, and they fall off, and you only have a bunch of limbs and tomatoes, but no leaves. That is the early blight devastating your tomato plant. So there's two different uh, uh, things in which you can do in order to reduce or almost eliminate. You're never going to always eliminate, but these next two steps will greatly increase the productivity. And we've been doing this for seven years now, and we've had at the end of the season as green and lush plants as we did at the beginning of the season. Right. So, yeah, you want to remove those lower leaves. Um, And then also what you want to do is you want to take, well, mulch first. Mulch. Yeah, yeah, you want to mulch. But before you mulch, you want to take cornmeal. Um, So you want the whole grain yellow cornmeal. Just as long as it's whole grain and it's yellow, it doesn't matter. Um, 
what brand or anything like that, just the whole grain yellow cornmeal, and take a handful of it and put it on the base of the plant. This has a beneficial bacteria in it called trichoderma. Not a made-up thing. It's a real thing. It's also in the uh, bell buster um, uh, item that you use to, to break down the uh, to condition the bale from uh, for straw bell gardening from bellbuster.com. Trichoderma is also in cornmeal. Many countries in the world have figured out that trichoderma is very beneficial. The United States here we're way behind on a lot of things, but you you just handful around the base of the plant at the time of planting that's going to fight the bad bacteria that's going to fight that early blight and greatly reduce the bad bacteria in that soil now you can throw it on at the time of planting and water it it's not going to uh not it, it's not going to hurt the cornmeal by getting it wet it's still going to do its thing in addition to that you want to mulch around the plant because the combination of the cornmeal and the mulch will, great, will reduce your early blight by like 90%. If you can mulch around all of your vegetables, it's very helpful. But tomatoes, it helps prevent that early blight, and it also helps keep the, the water in. The uh, It's a nice ground cover for the tomatoes, and it helps yeah, it helps keep the moisture in. So you want to you mulch around. 90% tomatoes. of the problems your tomato plant is going to face is from soil splashing up on the leaves. So... Uh, additionally, you want to trim the bottom lower six to eight inches of that plant all through the growing season to create an air a, a pocket down there that there's not consistent leaves close to the soil that's giving that opportunity for that soil to splash up. Uh, we want to water consistently because late, uh, uh, blossom in rot is the result of lack of watering. Right. So what happens is that if you get that blossom end rot, a lot of people will say, you know, add up some salt. Yeah, add up some salt. Take some tums, whatever but, water. But and if some you tums. if you remember eighth grade science, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Blossom in root rot is a lack of calcium. Right. Those two so, out. Those those don't work together. No, they don't. And that's the thing is that. So the reason why when you add up some salt or whatever to your to your tomato plants and then you you water that in. And then all of a sudden you don't have that blossom you, end rot. You water it. because you're, do, yeah, you're doing the watering. So all of that calcium that's locked up in the soil is now able to be picked up by the plants. And this also occurs on your peppers, on your zucchini. A lot of plants have that calcium deficiency because the watering is not occurring. Some of it might be a slight pollination problem, but the majority is the lack of water because you have calcium in your soil. It just cannot be picked up because it's too dry. Right, and so that's something to keep in mind is for all your plants is to have consistent watering, and if you have the ability to invest invest in some sort of, sort of irrigation system, it's worth the it's, worth it. yeah. it's definitely worth uh, it. Also, we want to get the tomatoes up off the ground. By caging your tomatoes in some form or fashion, you will increase the harvest by 50%. This is a true, scientifically proven fact. We have experimented with it, and it has shown that we've lost we we lost 50 percent of the harvest because they weren't caged versus the 50 versus the plants that were vertical because the plants the the heart the the fruit was not on the ground insects and slugs and everything else didn't get a hold of it because it was elevated mm -hmm. so with tomatoes we need to get them off the ground and we recommend using a product called the easy step plant support system from easystepproducts.com and uh disclaimer uh you can get a cute you can get an extra a third plant support system absolutely free when you purchase of any kit by using promo code Joey, my name, one, two, three, little plug there for them. Uh, it's a very sturdy. It's made with a, um, a, a metal steel post, all made in America. It's got rings in which is adjustable on the post. And you do not have to, you know, fiddle or fight with the plant, no matter what size or what, uh, time of the growing season, you can attach the Easy Step Plant Support System around your berry plant, your tomato, your shrub, your tree, and it's not going to damage the plant. Uh, it's it's got a ten year warranty on it, made in America, so they're they're not messing around. This thing is very durable, and it has been uh, unscientifically tested to support plants and keep them vertical of wind speeds of over fifty miles an hour. So Easy Step Plant Support Systems from EasyStepProducts.com. Uh, you can get that free 
uh, third plant support system absolutely free with purchase of any kit when you use uh, promo code Joey123. So you want to also, another tip you can do is remove the lower leaves of the plant. So you would do this throughout the season, uh, maybe every couple of weeks, and that will help prevent that early blight as well as removing those lower leaves of the plant because it's not touching the soil. It's going to less likely have the, the splash up on it, and that is definitely important um, to do so. Uh, yeah, you gotta, you've got to remove those lower leaves in order for that to... Um... To do what it needs to do so uh and then you want to consistently harvest you've got basically two types of tomatoes in which you can grow determinate which means they will grow to a certain height bear all their fruit this is labeled on the plant on the seed packet or indeterminate which is a vine the determinate is more of a bush plant the de- indeterminate is more of a vine it will grow indefinitely until frost kills it or you kill it and it will bear fruit throughout the growing season. So whichever one is best for you, if you want all the harvest at once, or if you want it to trickle throughout, you know, have a consistent harvest um, throughout the season. There. I mean, you don't have to choose one or the other. You we can do grow, both. Yeah, yeah, you can grow a combination. And then there is semi-determinate, which is it will put on all of the, the fruiting in the bulk of the time, and then it will kind of slowly fruit throughout the season. Yeah, but get, that, get them up off the ground, easy step products.com is that uh, location for the plant support system that you will buy once and never have to buy again. So this is just a small snippet of growing tomatoes for the best success. I mean, we can, again, put together a 60-minute show on all the do's and don'ts and how's and how nots to grow tomatoes and what you need to look for. We do a garden talk back when we used to do garden talks in this world, and it was about an hour and 15-minute talk, uh, and we, we didn't even get through most of the content there because there's so much uh, going on. But send an email, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, if you have a question in regards uh, to whatever it comes to about growing tomatoes, and we will get you a video, a link, uh, the content that you need. Well, if you either need whether you produce uh, your own vegetables and or your own meat and you're looking for products in order to turn that meat into edible products Walton's has the tools and the spices for you yeah so waltonsinc.com has everything you need to make any type of meat product you can find specials and sales online only and then um, meatgistics.com will help you uh, educate you on the whys and hows of meat processing, as well as there's a community there of almost 15,000 users who will help give their opinion and guidance on the meat processing issues. So Walt Kids has decades of experience in the meat processing industry, whether it be seasoning, equipment, supplies, you can make sausage, jerky, um, any other meat product your way to your high standards. And that's waltonsinc.com. Otherwise, for to, to commit, connect with that community, to learn how to... Uh, the hows and whys of meat processing, you're going to go to meatgistics.com. And when we come back, we're going to talk about nematodes. What are they? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they both? You're listening to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you love growing tomatoes, then you have to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim's. At the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would like to easily grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, flavor, less bugs, and diseases. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high quality tomatoes and it's made with 12 natural ingredients so pure you could feed them to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting, then sprinkle one cup around the plant one month later. That's all it takes to grow the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you'll not have to guess what's wrong with your tomato plants because it has everything they need. Grow the largest and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit rootmaker.com. 
Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee. 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at MySoulBrew.com or find them on Facebook at MySoulBrew. With the right tools, plant maintenance is easy and more effective. Ironwood Tool Company has the right tools for your project. From pruners to loppers to saws and shears and cleanup tools, get the right tool for this season, making your job much easier. Find them all at ironwoodtools.com. How would you like to be able to fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one product and at the same time improve the soil and root development? Introducing Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush and healthy lawn you can be proud of, and it takes away the expense of hard work that comes with mechanically aerating and dethatching the lawn. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about the amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. Use discount code GARDEN-TALK for 10% off your order. Do you know there's a real Tiger Torch? Visit tigertorchltd.com for more information. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. I love the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And like you, we've all struggled to find a good plant support system that can last for more than a season or two and be easily stored. But now there is. Easy Step Products manufactures a unique, multifunctional, multi-purpose plant support system. It's designed for tomato plants, but it's useful for any vegetable or flowering plants you grow. This is like having a 24-7 bodyguard for your plants. The 60-inch heavy-duty Easy Step in post and Easy Rings are overbuilt by design, so that when you combine the two together, they make the perfect plant support on the market. We've never seen anything like it. We love that you can add it during the growth cycle without damaging the plant. It's easy to adjust them up or down. They store easily. They even have a no-hassle 10-year warranty. Order now and receive the third plant support absolutely free with purchase of a kit and use promo code JOEY123. Buy yours today at EasyStepProduct.com or visit the dealer locator for the closest retailer near you. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloomin' Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. We talked about tomatoes in the first segment there and the consistent watering is required for tomatoes tree diaper can provide that consistent watering so you don't have many problems that others may do if your plants could talk to you they would have a few complaints about not being properly watered either too little or too much you don't want your plants to be mad at you (laughs) no so how do you water properly well you take the guesswork out by using the tree diaper tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that stabilizes soil moisture by taking up excess water and slowly releasing it when plants need it the tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly release water over three weeks no pipes hoses or electricity needed whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants made in the usa check out all the sizes they have available at treediaper.com it'll make your plants happy that's treediaper.com treediaper.com so there are things under the soil we talked about a little bit of this last week on the program uh there's a lot of things under the soil that we can physically see and many many things in which we cannot see but science has shown and the results of the healthy plants or non-healthy plants uh are a result of and we're talking about nematodes there are good nematodes and there are bad nematodes and we're just going to unravel a little bit of this 
uh, under the soil mystery as uh, much like the tomatoes. This is a whole show in itself as well, talking about the life under the soil and the importance of nematodes and understanding all of that that goes on, Holly. Yeah, so they are microscopic um, insects, and they are sometimes referred to as roundworms, and they are they they're a smooth worm, but they have these sharp teeth that they use to eat your plants, eat the cell walls of your plants. So they're super super tiny. Now that's the bad ones, right? And then the good ones, yeah. um, they eat the bad nematodes, and they also eat l- different larvae and grubs. So. Yeah, so the bad nematodes are what most people are concerned with. Well, yeah, if you have no problems, then everything is in a harmony and everything's good in the garden, and you don't have to worry about it because everything's happening just the way it's supposed to. But if you get a problem of an infestation of bad nematodes, then uh, there's a lot of telltale signs that can show you this. Right. So one thing is is that you're going to have typically stunted plants because they are eating the cell walls, which don't allow the cells to um, to generate. De- develop, right. Develop. Yep. And then another thing is uh, premature wilting because obviously if they're eating the cell walls of the plant, the plant's not getting the nutrients it needs. And then the, the yellowing of the plant, which means that it's because of just how the nematodes are consuming that plant. Um, from the inside, from the root. And, and so, see, and, and, but it doesn't mean that if you have a yellowing plant, you have nematodes. Right. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Just because you have, and that's why you, it, it's very important to be aware of what's going on in your garden. If the plants are dry, water, you know, if, if you, you check off all the boxes, the plant's been watered, the plant, you know, there's been no chemical drift or chemical issues that would cause curling or stunting of the plant, then you've got to go, okay, now what's the next thing on the list? Do I have a nematode problem? Because everything that I'm seeing now is only pointing in that direction. So that that's kind of what I'm getting. Yeah, that's what you were driving at as well. That, you know, just because it's one thing doesn't mean it's always that one thing. Right. So, yeah, exactly. So you have to do the process of elimination. Now, if you take care of one issue, whether that be um, the yellowing or the stunted plants or what have you, and then you still have the other issues, then you might want to consider the fact that you could have nematodes. So you can combat them a number of ways. Okay. Um, one. So it's not a devastation. I've got it. Now I'm done gardening forever. No. Okay. So if you, so say it's near the end of the season uh-huh. and you're like, well, I might have nematodes. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I do, but now I'm going. Now I'm kind of done with gardening for the year. So what you can do is you can then remove any vegetation, and then you want to add organic matter to the soil, mix in the organic matter that's going to disturb those nematodes. Um, and you think, aren't they going to eat the organic matter? And no, they like to feed off of live plants. So if you add organic matter and disturb them and remove the plants, then you'll help kind of disturb those bad nematodes, and if they don't have anything to eat, then they're going to die. Right. Um, And then you can also move crops. So if you notice that you might have a nematode problem on one crop, say it's your, like, tomatoes or something, if you move them to a different location, then you're like Leslie to have that problem. If you're super, super concerned, you could not plant in that area for a couple of years, um, but you want to try to avoid that. Now, now for people who may go, well, what if I have nematodes? How do I actually, you know, prove that I do? The only way to accurately diagnose a nematode problem is to send the soil to a a laboratory uh, and uh, send a sample to a laboratory to a nematode laboratory for analyzation. The lab will extract the nematodes from your soil sample to determine whether or not they present a potential damaging problem or have a or if they're if they're, the number of nematodes out you know per capita i guess is a better term to determine whether or not you have a potential problem because you all soil has good and bad it's whenever you have more bad than good is whenever you begin to see these problems on your plants right and another thing is is that i know we talk all the time about consistent watering but but it's so helpful to your plants and it also makes them strong it keeps them healthy and it keeps the nematodes from wanting to attack them well just like you know i weren't holly and i are not doctors and we don't pretend to play any but we've all heard this from tv and everything else if you are healthy and you stay hydrated and you eat as healthy as you can type of thing and take your vitamins and you know all that stuff 
uh, you are more able to fight off and you have a good immune system, you're more likely able to fight off germs. Right. Just like a plant, a healthy plant can fight off bad bugs and even uh, protect itself from a colder temperatures than a dehydrated or a sick plant could. Um, Yeah. So I know we talk about watering all the time, consistent watering, but it's very important and it's very important to get yourself on that schedule. And once you get yourself on that schedule, then it's going to it's going to always be something that is on your mind. Right. So, I mean, with nematodes, most of us have never dealt with it or needed to worry about it. Um, but it is something in which we need to be aware of the situation because just like, you know, in gardening, the more we learn, the better off we are. So we can knock those, you know, oh, it's not this. It's not that. It's not this. Oh, it's got to be that because all the telltale signs like we, we talked about it. Um, you can, and, and, you know, we can bake the soil in order to get rid of them. Like you, you know, talk, at the end of the season, you put a, a sheet of plastic over the soil cover it with two sheets of, of clear plastic and then it'll raise the temperature and that can kill the the bad nematodes. You can add good nematodes. You can purchase good nematodes. Yeah, you can add good nematodes and it's it's okay to, to add the good nematodes, especially maybe if you are – the good nematodes eat grubs. Yes. So if you have a lot of grub problems, it's not a bad thing to add those nematodes. And this is not just for the garden. You can do this to your lawn as well. You can yeah. add the nematodes and you want to do it early in the morning or late in the evening, but uh, – this can be beneficial for that as well. Yeah. So there's many reasons to add nematodes, and it's not a bad thing to add them. It's not going to harm your ecosystem. As long as you buy them from a local garden center or a local area, you should be fine. I wouldn't buy nematodes from overseas or no, something like no, that. No. Um, I don't even know if you can them. legally do that anyway. I don't know yeah. either, yeah. but who, who knows at this point. Well, when we talk about nematodes and the good bugs and the bad bugs, well, there's a bad bug, and it's called the Japanese beetle. And summer is near. The temperatures are warming up. You want to enjoy your backyard without dealing with those bugs or your garden, and Phylum Bioproducts has that product that can fix it for you. Right. So with spring just around the corner, or for many of us, it's here at this point, or getting close. And Grub Gone can be applied to turf or garden or around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that beetles have on your yard this summer. It's easy to use. You apply with a commercial spreader and irrigate into the soil. And it specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming beneficials such as bees, ladies, bugs, and butterflies. And to be honest, it's the only non-chemical that works. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. When we come back, author Kelly D. Norris will be with us with his new book. You're listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show program to help your garden grow better. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Gardening is the number one hobby and birding is the number two hobby nationwide. They go hand in hand. Birds help gardens grow by eating bad bugs. Reward them with Wild Delights premium quality mixes. Wild Delights premium mixes are made with tasty nuts and berries and not just filler food like Milo and cracked corn. Feed the birds the nutrition they need. This keeps your feathered friends coming back year after year for your visual delight and for the happiness of your garden. Keep your feeders full all year round with Wild Delight premium bird food find out more at wilddelight.com the water hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush conforms to various shapes for your watering needs the water hoop reduces runoff and saves money visit waterhoop.com did you know that all flour is not created equal Janie's Mill carefully stone grinds all their certified organic wheat, rye, corn, buckwheat, and heirloom and ancient grains so that you get every bit of taste and nutrition nature intended. Some flowers really are better than others, and you deserve the best. Get it at janiesmill.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds for gardeners just like you. They have over 600 varieties. 
Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Rinse Kit, your hose on the go. No pumping, no batteries. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out for up to five minutes of spray time anywhere. Spray it, wash it, Rinse Kit. Ship Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Ship Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Chapin has the tools to help you this season. We have a wide range of sprayers to help you control pests, weeds, and fertilize your plants. From handheld to ATV sprayers, we have it all. Use our broadcast spreader to feed and seed your green spaces. Water and feed at the same time with our fertilizer injectors. Find Chapin equipment at major home improvement and hardware stores and online at chapinmfg.com. Chapin, cover more ground. This week's garden tip is brought to you by Yard Glider, the cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at yardglider.com. That's yardglider.com. To increase the germination of your carrots, you should use seeds that are no older than two years. After planting them, you need to cover them with a board or cardboard until they germinate. This can take 14 to 21 days. At that point, remove the covering once you start seeing the white stringy plants underneath. The covering is used to hold moisture in the soil next to the seed coat for proper germination. By doing this, you will increase the germination of your carrots by 80%. This week's garden tip was brought to you by Yard Glider. The cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. We've been using a game-changing tool called SeedLinked to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at SeedLinked.com or download the mobile app today. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at piperandleaf.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Do you have ants in your house? We had some in our bathroom. We don't have them anymore because we used the rescue bait tra- uh, ant bait trap. Right. So we actually have ants every spring. And so we always get them like mid April and sure enough they came around. So they and what happens is ants seek moisture sources to feed their colonies and food as well. And once they establish that food source, they lay pheromone trails for other ants to follow. And so what happens is that with the ant rescue ant bait stations, they will transport the bait back to the colony, killing ants at the source. So they look for sugars to feed their workers and protein to feed their queen and larva. Rescue ant baits use both protein and sugar for a faster, more complete colony kill. And unlike any other ant baits that leak and spill bait on your floor, rescue ant baits are spill-proof and mess-free. I notice that they are very well contained um, when we when right. we set ours out. And they're child-resistant and safe to use around the home. Better bait, no mess. 
uh, rescue ampates have it all. You can go to rescue.com. They're made in the USA. Again, that's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Kelly D. Kelly D. Norris is one of the leading horticulturists of his generation. He is an award-winning author and plantsman and has a new book out called New Naturalism. Naturalism. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join not only Holly and us and educate us, but all of our listeners across the country. Now, you have a passion for... You have a passion for planting more natural plants. We have a lot of listeners who have small spaces and need to grow in pots or containers. Is there a way to grow in containers with more prairie or meadow-style plants and have it looking pleasing and not out of place? Oh, I certainly think so. I, you know, I, I do a lot of, uh, well, I do a fair amount of container gardening myself because I like to experiment with new plants and containers. It gives me a chance to learn about plants up close. And, you know, sometimes I think when we have you know, larger, wilder spaces, sometimes it's like the inverse. The container becomes almost the the structural, architectural moment. So sometimes I grow plants like, like yuccas and those sorts of things, you know, in containers and use them as a sort of counterpoint to other wilder natural kinds of planting. But I, I think in short, you know, you can, you can certainly have a lot of fun experimenting and learning about uh, plants in a wilder way inside of containers. Well, a lot of people are buying houses right now and will often get a bunch of perennial plants with that house. I know many people feel bad if they, uh, if they want to change things up uh, with the plants or get rid of them and start fresh. Why should people change their landscape and, and uh, do what they want to do? So what are some classic perennial plants that someone should consider keeping if they, if they are able to purchase a home with them already there? Well, it certainly depends on, you know, what part of the country, you know, you're in. I mean, the whole idea about new naturalism is really thinking about place and about plantings that really resonate with place. So certainly if people are coming into a new home and appreciating or maybe learning or studying what existing plantings they have, you know, certainly take a, a look at maybe things that are already doing well or things that might be native, that might be a part of the you know, the garden already, Um uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always sort of, I, I think, worth a study of what's already there and use that as a place to, to start from or really just to keep going. Uh, you know, we don't always have to start new gardens or new plantings entirely from scratch. And so I think, you know, uh, th- there's, um, I know when I came to my home garden here, uh, the home I bought about four years ago now, there were certainly some, you know, some attempts at, at gardening at various points in, by previous owners. And, you know, flowering right now is a great flowering quince up along the foundation, which is sort of a, you know, it's kind of a wilder looking plant. It's certainly not native to uh, the U.S., but it's certainly a, a great harbinger of spring and kind of wilder in character. And it fits this sort of overall aesthetic and, and uh, mode of my garden uh, quite well. So I'm, I'm actually, you know, quite pleased to, to have it as well, too. And I, there, you know, also happens to be things like Virginia bluebells, which are native, in fact, but are things that the previous owner you know, sort of adopted into her garden as well. So I, I love, you know, sort of embracing those elements of the past or those remnants of gardens that might become part of a, a new effort under under new management, as it were. Right. And, and you know, like you said, you don't want to necessarily wipe the slate clean because, number one, some of the plants that may be in the landscape of the home you bought are quite pricey and maybe somewhat rare. Well, certainly, you know, you, you know, you, you, Absolutely, it could be the case. You could certainly end up with uh, with all sorts of things. You know, it's, it's like if you have uh, some nice pieces to work with, it's something that gets you started, and you can always sort of change them later. But you know, when you restart a, a garden entirely, uh, you know, that's it's a fairly disturbing activity from an ecological standpoint, and can certainly invite uh, you know weed pressures and all those other sorts of things. And so, oftentimes, you know, I encourage people to to really just assess the garden as they have it and, and to start to think about how their planting choices, if it's a garden, for example, that they have inherited with a house or something uh, that they've bought, uh, you know, it, their planting choices can come to just affect the trajectory of that planting in a new and, and perhaps positive and progressive fashion. Okay. So your new book um, is New Natural Naturalism. Can you tell us something about the book interesting or notable and why our listeners would enjoy checking it out. Well, new naturalism is a conversation between gardeners. I I am certainly a wild hearted gardener. I have been fascinated by plants, both in wild places 
as well as by plants and gardens for really the balance of my whole life. And uh, the, the book sort of brings those two strands together in some ways to help encourage gardeners to just think about how we might invite more life into our gardens uh, and how we might ourselves even live in our gardens more. And I, I think gardeners today are, are keenly aware that our gardens are not separate from the world around us, that in fact that they're a, a little green square in this larger ecological quilt that lays across the landscape and that every planting decision that we make, every new planting space that we, we create or that we, we commence is a stitch in that, in that sort of fabric. And so I think it's a great time in gardening right now because we're, we, we're, we're celebrating sort of the more is more attitude, right? More plants and more insects and more birds and more life and all of those um, the, the, the satisfaction and joys and rewards that we have from that. And so new naturalism is a, a, a one stroke and a sort of practical and encouraging. And, and in another, you know, certainly sort of lays on, you know, ways in which you can approach this that are grounded in science and practice as well, too. So I, I think there's a lot of things in the book for a lot of different kinds of gardeners. That's that's really great. So we are talking with Kelly D. Norris, one of the leading horticulturists of his generation. He's an award-winning author and plantsman and has a new book out called New Naturalism. So um, talking about your book, you know, there are those gardeners who have a really tidy aesthetic to their landscape and maybe they want to do, introduce some more natural, wild-looking plants, but they just don't quite know how. What are some great tips to perhaps mix that in? Well, certainly – grasses, no, no matter where you live in the country, you know, you know we, we all have a native grass palette that can be really valuable. And there are so many grasses, of course, that are celebrated for their ornamental characteristics. And so even just, you know, adopting one or two or three of those where it's appropriate, if, or if you're, you know, have a shady spot, for example, you know, where, where maybe carrots or uh, wood rushes or other native, you know, grass-like plants can thrive, you know, those things can really start to soften some of the other forms of plants that we may grow. And so I talk a lot in the book about combining different architectures of plants and kind of contrasting them and, and, you know, starting to sort of marry them together in a way where they play off of each other as opposed to, you know, simply just a collection of plants arranged as lollipops because we like the way they look. Like they, we have to think about, you know, how plants actually grow together and how they change over the course of the seasons because that's what we can learn from a plant community in the wild. I mean, that's sort of what, what the, the sort of those wild and natural places are thinking about. So I, I would encourage people, if, you know, you're starting to think about this. I mean, you can, you can pick a group of plants like grasses, you said, just which I sort of did by default there, but you can really just, in a bigger way, start to think about how plants relate to each other and how plants grow and change over the course of the season. You know, famously, many of the bulbs that we love in the spring, you know, are really quite ephemeral. They come up now and they do their thing and their foliage kind of goes through a period where maybe it doesn't look quite so nice and then it recedes, you know, into dormancy. And so one of the great things in thinking about the garden is almost like a choreographer is how do you layer something in so that that retreating foliage doesn't become as much of a focal point of the of what you see as compared to what you know what comes next? And so, sort of thinking about those layers of the garden and how they evolve throughout the gardening season is one way to just sort of you know as you as you look at your garden and start to assess some of them. Definitely. So I know I love visiting botanical gardens, and I definitely think that there's many benefits. Um, to them. And then, you know, they encourage you oftentimes to become a member. What are the ways that people can get the most out of their botanical garden visit, especially with something that's local and they enjoy going to periodically throughout the year? Oh, that's a great question. I, you know, that one of the, the things I think that we can all do today, or most of us can do with a smartphone in our pocket. I mean, we have incredible cameras right at our fingertips. And, and whether you are a good photographer or not, it doesn't matter. We, you have a visual device to be able to record change. And if you, whether it's in your home garden or your local botanical garden or public park, you know, if you have a chance to really be able to document and, and kind of chronicle the changes in plantings over the course of the season, I think you can be really surprised and you can find a lot to learn from about how plants evolve and change, uh, you know, in the course of a, a season. And it can be, 
uh, it can be really, really satisfying to sort of learn from, you know, just those small little moments and, and really embrace change, uh, even in something as relatively short as a single growing season. So the other thing I would say is if you're visiting a local botanical garden or a public garden, broadly speaking, you know, talk to the staff and the volunteers, ask good questions, ask them about their experiences growing plants because they're there every day in those garden spaces, cultivating them, making them happen. And so, you know, the more insights that you can collect as a gardener about plants and how they grow and how they interact and respond to the environment, those are, those are huge insights. Well, you have a book, a whole book about bearded irises, a guide to bearded irises. What are some great reasons for our, our listeners and Holly and myself to grow a bearded uh, iris and what, uh, and why should our listeners check that book out? Well, you know, uh, irises are uh, an important part of my my original flora as a gardener, and I think we all have those sort of plants that we uh, we liken to those seminal chapters in our gardening lives. And yes, many years ago, I wrote a book about uh, bearded irises. Uh, I think bearded irises are maybe, as irises go, one of the more accessible and and uh, uh, commonplace and familiar uh, irises. And of course, there's there's a there's thousands of different varieties in terms of colors and patterns. And so, uh, you know, bearded irises are the, the queens of spring in that way. And so, uh, you know, the, the, that book certainly, you know, kind of walks you through all things bearded irises, not only from their history and their colors and their, their patterns and how they kind of evolve, but as well as how to grow them and the different kinds and classes. There's six different classes of bearded irises out there that you can plant and really enjoy flowers from for you know really months in the growing season fantastic so um how can our listeners find out more about your great books all of your great information well you can uh check out kellydnorris.com you can sign up for my newsletter it's a great way to see you know just uh, what i'm up to and sharing a few sort of uh, insights and tips along the way. And, and I always love to hear from folks about their questions and their curiosities as it relates to uh, all things plants. Well, Kelly, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered to Holly and myself and all of our listeners and the, and the information you've shared with us. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. And when we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers. This is The Gardening with the Joey and Holly Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night dries clear and odorless it will not clog your sprayer deer defeat works for 30 days through rain snow and freeze safe effective and works on rabbits money back guarantee to purchase go to deerdefeat.com and use code radio to save 10 percent on your order deer defeat it can't be beat Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at DripWorks.com. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops by spraying on internal wood stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts, internal wood stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCodingsUSA.com. Straw bale gardening is all the rage. Get your bale started easily with the Bell Buster Straw Bell Conditioning Formula. This is the only product that has been specifically formulated for use in straw bale gardening. Each unit contains 250 million colony forming units of trichoderma, fungi, and bacillus bacteria in addition to the fertilizer itself produces fantastic results with a bountiful production of vegetable crops start with the best to get the best traditional or organic formula take the guesswork out of conditioning your straw bell go to bellbuster.com to find out more looking for a non-toxic fly control call the bug farm 1-800-248-BUGS bugs have essential oils always confused you like they did me take out some of the guesswork with simply earth 
The Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box will help you gain confidence and clarity in using essential oils to help make your home toxin-free. Here's how it works. You receive the recipe box with four pure essential oils, six recipe cards, and extras. Then you learn how to use your essential oils while making the recipes created by certified aromatherapists clear and concise step-by-step directions. Save money and detoxify your life. I got to make fun products that will detoxify my home while also learning safe ways to use my essential oils. The best part is these oils don't break my budget. Simply Earth's essential oils are 100% pure and come from the best farms from all over the world. Using essential oils to support your wellness doesn't have to be overwhelming. My home is one step closer to being toxin-free because I made the wax melts and more with the Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box. Visit simplyearth.com to find your recipe box and more. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Walton's Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Time for your questions, our answers. You've got a question. There's a couple of ways in which you can get that to us. You can send us an email to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com or... You can jam your phone, your fingers in your phone and give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. We got a lot of emails that came in this week. A lot of people don't want to talk to us, Holly, but they'd much rather send us an email, which is totally fine. And we're just going to see how many we can make it through here. First question, Holly, is can I use an old tire or tires for raised bed gardening? Well, most scientific studies so far um, indicate that tires um, have health hazards when they're burned. Um, As far as growing in them, there's not really any sort of proof that you can Hard evidence, yeah. Hard evidence. However, it's safer to just grow maybe like some pretty flowers in them. Right. Like you've seen, I'm sure, like on Pinterest or whatnot where they lay them out and spray paint them and grow flowers and they're really pretty. As far as edibles, they're the it's it's recommended not to do so. Yeah, Mother Earth cautions against growing edibles in tires as a long-term practice. As they age, the rubber tires do break down and release that chemicals, those, those metals, and there's like, um, uh, two dozen t- chemicals and metals in a tire. Um, so the fact that it breaks down slower means that those chemicals aren't going to leach in. There's not really a scientific proof. So in the short term, basically, grow in your own discretion. Would we do it? No, unless it was a non-edible plant or a, a sh- you know some kind of shrub or decorative thing. But um, many people, uh, we've got a... Facebook group, uh, uh, Raised Bed Gardening, I think is the actual name of it. I, I don't know. We, we've got a lot it's of raised bed gardening. yeah. We've got a lot of pictures and a lot of people that are showing that they are growing in tires, and that's their their deal. So, so you just want to you want to use your best discretion. I mean, growing up on the farm, that we grew tomatoes. And I mean, not all of them, but like a handful of six, seven tomatoes, and t- because the rubber would warm the soil up much, much quicker. 
That explains a lot of things. Oh, does it really? <laughs> Okay. Can you please advise me? Next question. Moving on. Can you please advise me on what uh, to put under trees? I use bark and landscape material under it, but the weeds grew through it. I now have planted ground cover under the trees, and um, it seems to be working. Should I continue to do that? Also, do I just plant, uh, do I need to plant more ground cover? Uh, And additionally, what is a good bean to grow i don't want the flat ones i had those last year and i didn't like them any advice thank you very much yeah so you can a lot of stuff there but let's let's work through it (laughs) you can keep the ground cover if that's working if it's worked don't if if it's not broke don't fix it right yeah now if you need to add more but also now be aware some ground cover spreads and propagates by itself so you need to be cautious of kind of what ground cover you may be wanting you may be getting into right so, yeah, definitely keep the ground cover, but be aware of what you're using. As far as green beans, we like Blue Lake, whether they're pole or bush beans. Very good beans. Great, yeah, great, round, flavorful. But you want to nice. harvest them before the actual seed inside that bean gets big because if you wait until, oh, I'll wait until it's big and bulky, I'll have more bean. You're going to be gnawing through beans. You want a, a medium sized bean when the uh, seed inside of it is still very tender. Right. So, you want to harvest it early on. Not when it's tiny, but when it's, you know, medium size. I'm looking to grow watermelon. I have failed many times. I usually just end up with a small, unripe melon. I'm in zone 4B. Is it too late? This season, what's the best method? I'm willing to try anything, but most of my growing is in a traditional garden bed. Thank you. Well, nothing wrong with the growing in the traditional garden bed. Um, with Thank you for the question. When you're in the zones four, five in that area, forget about the 80, 90 pound watermelons. Those are Georgia, Alabama watermelons, 100 pound. We don't have the growing season up here. Now, what we have found in our garden, and we have a video on this, we actually were successful in growing a watermelon. It's called Cream of Saskatchewan. It's a watermelon about the size of a volleyball, five to 10 pounds, give or, give or take. A thin, uh, it was yellow in flesh. Some of them are white in flesh. Ours was yellow. And it has a very sweet flavor, and we were able to grow it in a straw bell garden. And I would assume that since we have a regular watering regiment now because of Dripworks irrigation system and the tree diaper and the water hoop, we would be able potentially to grow Saskatch- cream of Saskatchewan watermelons without any issue now because of the consistent watering and the short season, and they're designed to grow in the northern climates of the United States. So uh, certainly a cream of Saskatchewan, Seed Savers Exchange does have those seeds available um, on their website, or if you can find a kiosk, they may have those also available. Uh, Let's see here. Question, what was the product you mentioned on your show uh, in regards to dealing with those nasty Japanese beetles and grubs? That's Phylum Bioproducts. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M Bioproducts. Dot com Phylum Bioproducts. All right. Question about Jerusalem artichokes here. How do you prepare Jerusalem artichokes? I'm not sure, and I don't even know if I should grow them. What can you advise me on? Sure. So we roast and bake them. Um, you, so what we do is we cut them up and put them in a roast, whether it be like in the slow cooker or low, low and slow in the oven. Um, I did a casserole with Jerusalem artichokes and potatoes. And yeah. w- what else did I add to that? I forget. Was it noodles? Like no, garlic. Garlic, yeah. But potatoes. Potatoes. Was it noodles? Cheese. cheese yeah. A lot of cheese. But, but the key on that was we peeled the Jerusalem artichokes. It got rid of that really earthy taste. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn this person. Okay. Um, Jerusalem artichokes have this... Uh, I don't. I think it's a. I don't know, it's a chemical yeah. essentially. It's like the makeup of the Jerusalem right. artichoke. It's called inulin, not insulin. Inulin, and when if you don't eat a lot of this inulin consistently, you get gas. Uh huh. And so if you're not used to eating, and some people have it much more intensely yeah. than others. We're not trying to be weird or funny or, or nasty. Gross or anything. No, but this no, is the reality to, yeah, of it. Yeah, it's it's 100 percent. Like when you made that casserole, I loved it. Right. But you know, it, it caused it problems. Caused, it caused me to have some right. some gas for the next day or whatever, a few hours or whatever. So <clears throat> that does happen. So, but the Jerusalem artichokes are delicious, and you might not have that reaction. It just depends on your your person, your makeup, whatever. So. Um, just keep that in mind. But we do like to roast them. You like you made that casserole. We put them in the air fryer. Air fryer. Yep. yep. Um, we, we made we, like sun choke. Uh, what's it called? Hash browns. Right. Uh, with the air fryer, we 
clean them, scrub them, and we've only done it with the skins on. We've never done it with the skins off, so we got to try that. We coast, coat them in vegetable or some type of oil and then air fry them, and they taste almost identical to fried potatoes in the air fryer. So uh, something to look forward to. They're not something you're going to typically find at a grocery store and even a health food store. It may be very, very scarce if you're able to find them. You're probably going to have to just get the starts or, or get the tubers and plant them and or keep in mind that they can be somewhat invasive. We're not talking like mint invasive or raspberry uh, runners invasive, but you can control them. You can. We go in every spring and kind of clean up the edges of the bed. We got about sixty square feet, and then those are the ones in which we can have an early spring harvest. And then after one hundred and fifty days of uh, one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty days, uh, then we can have a fall harvest when the tops get killed off by the cold temperature. But I would have to say my favorite way to eat them is in a roast. Mm-hmm. They get this really tasty, nutty, buttery flavor. Um, when they're cooked like that. So I definitely would recommend that. Right. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety? You can certainly do that by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, or we will make it easy for you. You can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to this program. Uh, Join us next week on the program where we'll be talking about spring lawn care maintenance as well as growing herbs. And author and our good friend of the Straw Bale Garden Book, Joel Karsten, will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.